I. So our amazing media services team, Mitchell and Alex, have uh, done a workaround, and so we are able to proceed with, with today's webinar. I'm Sandy Vandenberg. I'm Director of Planned Giving here at Torrance Memorial in the Foundation Office, and we're happy to welcome you here for the Taking Care of Your Financial Health Series. We bring this to you with, in participation with our Professional Advisory Council. They are a group of volunteer estate planning attorneys, CPAs, financial planners, professional fiduciaries, life care managers, folks who want to help educate the community on the importance of tax planning and charitable giving and how that all can work together to, to benefit you and your families. So we are um, going today to uh, talk about the keeping emotions out of estate planning and investing. I emailed everyone yesterday with the link for the Zoom thing today and also the handout was attached to that. So there is, um, there is one slide that's not in there, so when I post the recording online after we get that accomplished, the updated handout will be available there. So that is um, how we will proceed. We like to have you hold the questions until the end, and uh, you can enter them in the chat. You'll find the chat in the bottom uh, of your screen in Zoom. So please go ahead and type your questions in there, and we will uh, address all of those at the end. So, um, and we're taking a slightly different approach today. If you've attended our webinars before, we usually have all the presenters stand at the podium, but Grace and Phil, who are presenting today, want to make it kind of a, a discussion. So they will stay seated at the table and the camera will just um, follow them over there and then you'll be able to follow the slides as well. So, but before we get to that, I always like to do a little bit of a, of a highlight on uh, Torrance Memorial and what's going on here. As I've said in past seminars, the hospital has been very busy, um, not so much with COVID patients right now, but we have been uh, caring for a lot of people who have delayed their health care and are now sicker than um, what they might have been had they been able to do the preventive care and things they are um, used to doing uh, before COVID. So we um, have a high census right now in the hospital and the emergency department is also very busy. I put a few things on the screen here. Back on June 5, they saw 331 patients in the emergency department uh, and that is set a record for one of the top five days in the history of the hospital. And we've been around almost 100 years now. So in 2025, we'll be cele celebrating our 100 year anniversary. We're excited about that. And we're excited to, to uh, know that we can continue to give great care to all of our community. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a sneak preview. One of the things we're looking at and we'll probably start doing fundraising for next year is to expand our emergency department. And uh, we have the second floor above it, which is, uh, was vacated when we moved to the Lundquist Tower. And so we're, we're uh, beginning the process of planning for a second story to our emergency department, which could potentially even double its capacity. So watch for more news on that and uh, we, we uh, will continue to make every effort to do the best care possible for our community. I uh, want to give you a, a short video. It's, um, it just was recently put together and it kind of summarizes Torrance Memorial's mission and what goes on here. So let's watch the video. Torrance Memorial was founded in 1925 and has been serving the South Bay community for over 95 years. The employees, physicians, nurses, and volunteers of Torrance Memorial support our mission through a set of core values, which guide our care teams to promote the recovery and healing of our patients and their loved ones. Our mission is to improve the community health by offering the most current and effective medical treatment and technologies rendered in a compassionate and caring manner. The community of Torrance Memorial Medical Center recognizes that our commitment to our patients and their loved ones, our healthcare team, the general public, and to each other make Torrance Memorial Medical Center a warm and caring part of the South Bay Peninsula community. We share a common value for the worth of each person and a common goal of providing quality healthcare services. We are devoted to a healthcare team approach in delivering patient care 
offering support to our patients and their loved ones. We are proud to support the community as first responders, not only during the COVID-19 pandemic where our efforts were especially recognized, but throughout the year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's a nice overview of all the things that happen here at Torrance Memorial. So I hope you enjoyed that video. And I also want to highlight that Torrance Memorial has a, a channel on YouTube. So if you go to youtube.com and search Torrance Memorial, a lot of videos uh, we have posted there will come up for you to see at your, um, when you have the time to do that. So we continue to offer other classes and events here, mostly virtually, and I always like to highlight those who are interested in learning more about Medicare. The Medicare 101 is offered monthly by our Torrance Memorial IPA. The next one is scheduled for July 27 at 6.30. It's also um, via Zoom. You can learn more about that by going to torrancememorialipa.org and look at their uh, educational opportunities and follow through on the clicks there to find the, the link for that and uh, to be able to participate in that. We also have our health lectures series, Miracle of Living, we call it, and that the next one for that is on July 20, and it's on caregiver stress syndrome, and that also will be via Zoom at uh, 6.30. If you go to the torrencememorial.org website, and click on healthy living and classes, events, and you can um, click your way through to find where that is located also on our website. Or just email me and I'll send you a link. Maybe that's easier for some of you. I mentioned I'm director of plan giving and plan giving is the, the planning that happens when you want to do something with your estate in the future and you want to continue to give after you're gone. So there are some of the, these are some of the typical types of gifts. A bequest is most common, where you'll enter in your uh, trust and your, or your will that you would like to leave a percentage of your estate to Torrance Memorial to continue the support of, of this hospital that for you know generations to come. And we're so grateful for all of those who have done that. There are a couple income producing types of plan gifts, the charitable gift annuity, a charitable remainder trust, those are a couple things that you can avoid capital gains tax by putting assets into those and then receive income for the rest of your life. Um, the retained life estate is something where you can donate your estate to the hospital and turn over the deed, but you remain in your home until you're, you're gone, you, you, everything stays the same. And then after you're gone, the, the, it comes to, to um, Torrance Memorial. And then I wanted to just highlight a little bit uh, the, the uh, possibility to name Torrance Memorial as a beneficiary of your IRA and 401k. You know, when your heirs, um, when you give that to your children, they have to pay taxes on all of those distributions. They have to cash it out within 10 years. And so this is an opportunity for you to, um, you know, give other assets to them and and provide the, the, these assets to the hospital so there, you can avoid some of that tax liability. So something to consider and uh, to keep in mind as you're looking ahead to your, your planning. Torrance Memorial does have a heritage society and it's the group of people who have included us in their estate plan and we like to appreciate you while you're with us. So if you've done any of these things, please let me know so that uh, we can include you in the Heritage Society and, and uh, invite you to, to certain events and uh, appreciate you. We have a great website. It's uh, listed here at the top. It's on our foundation website and it gives a lot of good information about various um, different types of planned gifts. And I always like to highlight the, the estate planning kit because it's a really great tool. There's a, a lesson book and a record book. The record book is very helpful for you to bring together all the different aspects of your estate into one place. And so you can list your heirs in there and your various accounts and all of that kind of information can be put together in one place. So take a look at that. It's easy to download. If you have trouble with it, let me know. I can send it directly to you, the, the PDF document. So <clears throat> we are a nonprofit hospital, so we do depend a lot on the community support to keep things going here. So I always just like to remind you, these are the ways you can donate to Torrance Memorial and, um, and, and help support 
So now we're going to get into our presentation. So we are going to um, talk about um, the title here, Keeping Emotions Out of Estate Planning and Investing. With the Professional Advisory Council, we have co-chairs who share that role. Grace, who's presenting today, is one, and Larry Takahashi is the other co-chair. He's going to come and make the introductions for our presenters. Larry is a certified financial planner here in Torrance. His primary focus is helping clients build strategies for a successful retirement, including creating an effective retirement income plan and minimizing the impact of taxes during retirement and on their estate. So here's Larry. Thanks, Andy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we get started, I do um, want to read this disclosure. This material is for general information only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine what is appropriate for you, please consult qualified professionals. Okay, today's webinar is entitled Keeping Emotions Out of Estate Planning and investing, very timely topic. Uh, let me introduce today's speakers. First, we have Grace Greer St. Clair. Grace is an independent attorney whose office is located in Redondo Beach. Her major area of practice is estate planning and her additional legal expertise in real estate, general corporate and financial transactions allows her to also support the businesses of her clients, Grace began her career working with a large firm in downtown Los Angeles, which allows her to handle client matters with a large firm commitment to excellence and a small firm commitment to personal service. She endeavors to support local charities while serving her estate planning clients, providing them access to the local charitable endeavors that support their passions in creating family foundations. She is also an artist and began oil painting as a child. Her artistic talents add to her breadth of experience and enhance her practice as an attorney. Next, we have Philip Cook. Phil is a certified financial planner who has been in business in the South Bay for over 35 years. Located in Manhattan Beach, his firm Mogul Wealth Management Incorporated provides investment management and other financial planning services such as retirement planning for individuals and small businesses. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Grace and Phil. See, I forgot to turn on my mic. <clears throat> okay, hi there. Um, I'm glad we're doing this presentation right now because it's definitely necessary for the situation that we're in right now. We're watching things every day and there's all sorts of turmoil in our lives so it's perfect to talk about the emotions related to that. But I wanted to do this also because we usually talk about the rules about financial planning, estate planning, probate, uh, social security, but it doesn't matter what we tell you about with the rules, if your emotions are playing a part of your decision making, they're definitely going to impact what you're doing and cause you possibly to go astray. So first you have no choice. It's basically um, part of human nature. Uh, the only thing we can do about it is recognize it, figure out what we're doing and go from there to do uh, a smarter choices. Phil, do you wanna e go ahead? Emotions and decisions. Is that a terrific twosome or is that a terrible twosome? What happens when you hear a nearby attack dog snarl well, the first thing that happens is your amygdala. Things at the same time. Uh, and and it's, it's, it happens every time. Your uh, blood pressure goes up. Your sweat glands produce more output. Your, uh, uh, there's tension in your muscles. There's, there's hormones are flooded into the, stress hormones are flooded into the system and your eyes widen and your nostrils flare to help you with a hypersensitivity to the situation. The cerebral cortex starts making decisions. Uh, can I run fast enough? Do I have a cane that I can, a walking cane I can fight the dog with? Is there a tree nearby that I can climb? And ultimately you'll come to a decision and do one or the other. So what do you think happens when you're invested in the stock market 
and you just heard the market went down a thousand dollars, a thousand points today. Do you think all of that kicks in the fight or flight? So uh, the cerebral cortex, here's the information. Uh, market's down a thousand points today. And you start thinking, what do I know? Uh, Russia and the Ukraine, isn't there a problem over there? What happens if we get pulled into that mess? That certainly won't help me anything. Um, and I, I, know, I know a friend of mine just pulled everything he had in the market out of the market. And he's a pretty smart guy, made lots of money, so he must know what he's doing, right? He or she. And then, of course, uh, there's always the sky is falling scenario. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. We better take shelter. Grace? So what do we do? Sorry. <laughs> okay. The emotional triggers create fear. Fear is uh, something that we all act, uh, like Phil was saying, carefully about. It creates confusion and awareness of a lack of knowledge in our minds, which in turn creates distrust and fear. Fear of making a mistake, more fear, fear, fear. No one wants to make a mistake, and so we react instead of using critical thinking. The examples of this type of emotional uh, thinking you might do every day. So confirmation bias is one of them. Recent past bias, fear of missing out, which now has a name. I know last year it didn't have a name, now it's FOMO. If you've heard of FOMO, now that's fear of missing out. We have availability bias, we do pattern seeking, and we always listen to the wrong people. Why do we do that? Uh, let's go over confirmation bias first. So confirmation bias exists when we're set on a particular thought and we look for information to prove that thought regardless of whether it's true or not. So you, you've heard uh, that inflation is happening, so you know the egg prices are going to go up. So you just assume egg prices are going to go up. You, you go to the grocery store, sure enough, they've gone up. Even if they haven't, they have in your mind. My brother will act like this. My brother will fill in the blank, basically. He does this every time. The stock market happens every time. Same thing, fill in the blank. That's what we're doing. We look for the evidence and we find it because we're looking for it. When you're driving down the street, you know that light's gonna turn red. Sure enough, it turns red. Even if it didn't really turn red as soon as you would think it was, we're confirming our bias there. But we're only looking for that particular evidence because um, we are trying to prove a negative thought that we have. Even though other evidence is there, we don't see it. You know, so, uh, Grace, if I cut in a minute, uh, you mentioned the traffic light, and I thought that was a very apropos, because I know when I'm looking at the light to see if it's, I'm going to make the green light or not, everything else is blocked out. I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm just laser focused on that green light and not the safest way to drive. <laughs> That's so true. We all do it. So confirmation bias, like how does that happen in our practices, Phil? So in my case, one of my clients now is dealing with uh, being sued by her brother, and he's not the one involved in this particular question, but this, uh, his sister is sure that she had something to do with creating the trust a certain way, and all she's doing is finding evidence of that particular fact. She's not looking at anything, and none of the truth that we've shown her, she just insists that that's what's happening, and so she's going to fight as part of that. Um, another client of mine, um, had uh, two, uh, three children named uh, her oldest son as the trustee because her middle child has an illness and he's living in the home and she has another daughter. For sure, once she passes, even though we recommended against this, of course, but she named two trustees that have to agree on something. <laughs> but uh, she said it was for sure it was gonna be okay. So sure enough, we're having a problem. And uh, the gentleman who's going to receive the house is sure that his brother is overspending the money. What he doesn't know is his brother was spending the money and helping his mom pay her bills before that. Nothing has changed, nothing at all, but he's sure that something is happening. He's talking to his sister. She's sure something's happening. The two of them are feeding off each other, and now we have a problem. He changed the locks on the house to lock his brother out. 
Have you seen anything like this in your practice, Bill? Uh, yeah, it's very similar. Uh, two sisters grew up together. They had the same, they both had the same parents. They were, they, they got along and then only one of them got named as trustee. And all of a sudden, every day, it was an argument between the two of them. So it's kind of sad. Another case, recent cases, had a client for 25 years. She's 96 now. And uh, her daughters are kind of running the show for her. But the daughters, as a power of attorney or as a successor trustee, you're, you're charged with doing what's right for the, for, the, for the person, for my client. Daughter is charged with what's doing right for mother. Uh, instead, they're doing what's right for them. They are making everything easy. Uh, they're they're uh, liquidating her portfolio and putting it in the bank. And you can imagine what her mother's going to earn at, with these kind of interest rates. So um, they're doing what's best for them, not what's best for the mother. Yeah, probably because they have a feeling something is better if it's in cash. It's just easier. It's just yeah. easier. <laughs> How about recent past bias? What is that? Uh, the past always repeats itself. And I know uh, we always say that, but it's not always true. And it doesn't always repeat itself the same way, even if it did repeat itself. So when we have a recent past bias, we are looking at what our expectations are. We know something's going to happen, but the reality is much different. I think if you'll notice the, uh, the slide with all the pretty colors on it, uh, this is each color represents a different asset class. And some asset classes did better during a particular year than other asset classes. And so at the top, you can see the asset classes that did well in those particular years. Uh, let me point out 2007, EM stands for emerging market stocks. Stocks of companies in emerging markets like Thailand, uh, Mexico, Mexico, Korea, not, not, not South Korea, but um, India, uh, Turkey, et cetera. Stocks of, of companies in those countries and other emerging market countries did very well in 2007. They beat all other asset, asset classes. Uh, in 2008, look where they are, down at the bottom. They did the worst of any other. The next year, 2009, emerging market stocks were at the top again. So. How do you think you can predict that? Not very easily, if at all. It's just too random. Uh, and that's about the only pattern I see here is that there just isn't much of a pattern. Yeah, of <laughs> patterns. Um, I have a, an example of this happening in, in a very concrete way. So we did a succession plan for one of my clients who had a painting business. And based on the recent past of his two kids, he thought they weren't gonna be interested in taking over his business. So we set up this whole process to sell his business to three uh, long-term employees. And uh, when he passed away, he found out the boys did want to take the business over and actually found out that the employees really weren't capable of running the business. So um, we ended up getting out of that, of course, thank goodness. But that's why we have an out for any of those succession plans, just in case the business, uh, the uh, people that are assigned to take over don't do very well. The business owner has a right to get it back. So we took care of that, but it's interesting that something your kids did recently uh, does not necessarily mean they're gonna do it again or they're gonna react differently. And one of the things we can talk about later is uh, to solve this is about communication among your family members. We can have a family meeting to discuss these things. We used to do this in estate planning where we didn't really wanna tell anyone what we were thinking. We tried to hide this from the kids. The parents didn't want it you know, no one talks about politics and money with their family, right? <laughs> Same thing. But it doesn't work that well anymore. For some reason, kids need to be more involved. I think we have less litigation and less mediation problems if they understand what the plan is. And if he would have asked his kids, maybe before he tried to make that plan, we would have known that they'd be interested in doing that. So it, it all worked out okay. But we also have another client who um, his daughter set up a meeting with us and I thought it was interesting that she set the meeting up, but we do have those things happen when all the kids get together and the parents come in, we usually separate them and talk to the parents first. But for some reason, because she was so interested in the outcome, her father decided to eliminate her and reduce her, um, her distributions because he didn't think that was right, but he never did speak to her about it. So I'm sure there's going to be another issue later on, but that's another incidents of a recent past um, activity affecting the planning process. So basically recent past is about what ifs worrying and we all know what worrying does. It just causes more worry and we don't, it doesn't, we're not, it's not enjoyable. 
and thoughts based on fear. And the picture that Phil was going over, it's not different. It's just markets fluctuating. That's what happens with the market. We all know that, right? We do know that. So um, the other one we have, how about a fear of missing out? And uh, it has a name now, FOMO. So fear of missing out is we don't want to miss out on something else that someone is benefiting from. So the, my favorite is Bitcoin. Everyone is making money in Bitcoin. And then just recently, this is a recent past bias in our favor, I guess. Just recently, Bitcoin went to the bottom, not completely to the bottom, but went down quite a bit. So that's something that a bunch of people got into. Another example is recently we had a situation where GameStop was going up and up and up. So everyone got in because they wanted to make money. So they are actually buying high. Phil can go over that in a minute. But they're not buying low, which is how we, we should do things. But they're, they're, they don't want to miss out. So they get involved in Bitcoin whether it's right for them or not. Um, a lot of things that happen in my practice about this, there's the, my friends are putting their kids on their real estate, their banks account, so I'm gonna do it too. It seems to be working out for them. Um, and those cheap um, estate plan uh, planning tactics don't really do the right thing for people uh, and they have unintended consequences. So um, when you have FOMO in estate planning, we want to benefit from a friend um, uh, who's, okay, sorry, I've got this client, so I'm sorry. Um, basically, this man, gentleman, doesn't have any children, and his neighbors lived across the street from him for many years, and suddenly he has a new friend, and uh, granted, he's known him for many years in a different way, but she doesn't know that. So she's suddenly showing up every day trying to figure out if he's gonna, she's going to miss out on him giving property away or something. It's very suspect. Uh, but he's going to, he took care of his estate plan and got it all taken care of. So it goes to the gentleman that he met long time ago, but they've been communicating, uh, not in front of her face, obviously, but um, they've had plenty of time to get to know each other. And he wants to benefit a friend of his. Um, so when kids start thinking of FOMO, uh, they feel like someone's going to get more money, more power than them, and they're worried about it. They all believe they're the best relation to their family member, and they want to get the best um, benefits from being close to their parents. How about you, Phil? You must see this a lot. Uh, I see it every, every once in a while. Um, a lot of times, um, the, the thing that worries me the most about uh, elderly clients is if they have a caregiver, because the client gets more and more and more dependent on that caregiver the older they get. And if the caregiver isn't pure of heart, uh, you can see some unhealthy things happen uh, financially. So, Yeah, caregiver fraud is, is rampant right now, so we have to be careful with that. Um, the next one is availability bias. This is when we look closely for the most uh, easily uh, obtained information. And where, where's the most easily obtained information? It's Google. So I know I Googled it, so it's right. Um, I saw a post on Facebook, so I'm going to do that. That's the right thing. Availability bias is a human tendency to think that the examples of things that come readily are more important than those that we we actually that are actually the case. It's a psychological phenomenon. For me, it's funny when you look at the frequently asked questions in, on the internet anytime. My question is never in those frequently asked questions because those questions are so basic. So a lot of times we need more information. So it's always better to get more information from a variety of sources than just one Google. It's good to be informed, but not misinformed. Grace, if I might add to that, um, one of the things that I see is uh, I get a phone call from a client and the conversation always starts like this. What do you think about X, Y, Z? Well, I don't know. I don't know anything about X, Y, Z. Well, where did you find that information? Well, I was, uh, I, I subscribed to a newsletter. Uh, I saw a newsletter advertised. And uh, if I, the newsletter says it has the perfect way of making money guaranteed, no risk, big returns. Uh, all you have to do is subscribe to the newsletter to find out what to do. And I can promise you, once you subscribe, you'll be disappointed. They'll talk about stuff that, that, uh, that is very theoretical and not likely anybody is able to do. So be careful of the, um, I've got the answer, answers. <laughs> Your sound economic decisions. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. So I'm up now. <laughs> Sorry, I, did, I wasn't turning the pages fast enough. I got caught up in my 
conversation. Um, <clears throat> do you have enough information? So you, you, you saw a threat, the body automatically uh, just starts reacting the way it does. It's unconscious, it's automatic, it happens. So now you wanna start gathering information. Do you have enough information to make a sound decision? What ifs? What if the market keeps going down? What if the moon doesn't come up tonight or the sun doesn't come up tomorrow? What if, what if? Um, and we're gonna talk more about those a little bit later, but it's just speculation. That's all it is, it's speculation. You have no facts to say whether that what if is likely or not. Uh, most investors have little or no knowledge of the, of the stock market, a deep understanding of the stock market over the last hundred years. Recognizable patterns. Are there any recognizable patterns that you could take advantage of going into the future? Uh, the past can teach you a lot about what's likely to happen. Uh, and you should always, <laughs> I get calls, well, the economy, I'm worried about the economy. There's always something to worry about when it comes to the economy, always. It'll never be a perfect, nothing to worry about scenario. So understand that and don't let, don't let that make, don't let that be too big of an influence in your decision. So let me ask you, you've got all these what ifs, you've got some thoughts, you've got some not sure, and the market hasn't been good lately. And there's been talk about inflation, there's talk about the Federal Reserve, whatever that is, raising interest rates. There's talk about, uh, as I mentioned before, Russia and the Ukraine. So all of that, let me ask you a question. If you walk out of your house, you could get hit by lightning, right? Yeah, you could. Do you buy lightning insurance? Assume it's available. Do you buy insurance to, to, uh, to take care of that in case you do get struck by lightning? No. Why not? Because you know what the odds are. They're really, really, really small. It's kind of like winning the lottery. The odds are really, really, really small. So, so uh, you don't have enough information to judge. You probably don't have enough information to judge what's going to happen in the stock market tomorrow, next month, next year. Um, Believe me, if we knew what the stock market was going to do, we'd all be millionaires, but then how would that work out? Isn't that the truth? Now, what really happens, I, I, my, based on my 35 plus years, what I see clients doing is they look at their statement, and this happens especially after they retire and they're not working, and they see the value of their account go down. Then the amygdala starts to kick in. What if I run out of money? What if I don't have enough to live on? Blah, blah, blah. What if, what if, what if? And... Um, they, um, uh, nobody likes that when that happens, but the market will go up and down. Its long-term trend is up, and we'll talk about long-term in a minute. Its long-term trend is up, but um, so, so you should rely on that repeating. It's been that way for the last 200 years. It'll probably be that way for the next 200 years. Uh, and um, don't let your what if overthinking, and that really is nothing but overthinking and speculating, get in the way of rational thinking based on the facts. Right. I think overthinking is the key there. What ifs create a lot of overthinking in our minds. And so we just keep going over and over about something that might happen. And then we think it's going to happen. I know in my, in my practice, we do a lot of what if thinking for you. That's the whole point. So we, knowing your family well and getting the questions answered about what your goals are, we're able to figure out what are the possible what ifs that could happen in your estate plan? And that's what we're doing. So we get 75% of them. There are plenty of outliers out there that you never know. Um, these two cases, I have two cases in my office where the two, the husband and the wife are both being sued by a family member. I don't know what the odds of that are. Hopefully very small. But in both cases, it's all about the what ifs and, and uh, different things that they're sure are happening when they aren't happening, which is confirmation bias. But um, that's, you know, these what ifs cause you to uh, to make, uh, you know, just freak out about things. Now, we really don't need to do that. The plan that we create in our office is usually a good plan that should last for, for you and handle things. Um, the outliers are un, unusual in most cases, and not very many have them. Both those plans weren't my plans, but we're, we're handling the issues. So what ifs are detrimental probably to most of our thinking. In addition to that, what ifs also are about pattern seeking too. Like you, do you see a pattern? We showed you this, this uh, um, colorful uh, graph. graph earlier, thank you. 
And I don't see a pattern there unless you look at the colors. The colors are all a pattern. How about this pattern here? We're trying to see order where there's only, only randomness. And this one is more random than the one I created. So I created a pattern for you to look at. Would you rely on this? Is this really a pattern? Is it all green arrows? Is it green arrows that are mostly horizontal? I don't know. Is there a pattern there or not? The idea is you're trying to find a pattern where there always is, isn't always a pattern. And it's important not to uh, expect things to happen the same way, but we all, we all do it. We seek patterns from our friends' conversations. I think that's where we see a lot of patterns, baby. We get them from our friends. What about listening to the wrong people? This is my favorite one. Why do we listen to the wrong people? We all know we do it. Um, let's just play the song in your mind, the Jeopardy music. Ready? Dum, 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 dum. It's spelled D-U-M-B, but sometimes we, we do that. Um, the idea is the, uh, we, talk, we want you to talk about the right things with the right people, but we always listen to the wrong people. Um, or not always, I guess, but we do have a tendency to do that. The, the basically, there's a bunch of information out there, and the blue circle shows stuff that's really might be important to you, and then everything else is really noise, but we're always hearing the noise and focusing on noise, and we need to focus on what the right information is to our particular situation. Grace, one of the ways I, I talk about that with my clients is to say that if you're driving your car down the street, are your eyes looking at every billboard that goes by? No, probably not. That's just noise. That'll get in your way of getting to your destination safely. So seek the right information from the right people. Yeah. A lot of times we hear patterns or, or um, things from our friends and that so-and-so had this situation and it comes up all the time. So-and-so did it this way. It didn't work out. So-and-so did it this way. Oh, they gave all their money to their three kids evenly and it didn't work out. Or they gave their three properties, one each to a child that didn't work out. It, everyone's plan is basically particular to their own needs. And so it doesn't matter what your neighbor's doing, what your friends at church are doing. It doesn't matter what um, your um, old friends that you talk to once in a blue moon on the phone are doing. It's up to you to have your own plan in place. And that's why working with an advisor works the best. Do you want to talk a little bit about the things that we do with our money? Um. Well, one things of the things we know, that, but do not do. Yeah, one of the things that you must understand is noise is the media. You will never learn anything of substance in a, a, a newspaper article that's this wide and this long. It'll never have any substance for you. You don't have enough information. So be careful. The media has its own objective, and that is to make money for the owners. So how do they make money? It's their advertising revenue that comes in that makes them money. Not, not subscribers, it's, it's advertising. And how do you get more advertisers? Well, you get more eyes on the tube, more eyes on the page. You get more people looking at it. That's why Super Bowl ads go for millions of dollars for a 30 second ad, because there's so many people watching. That's what the, that's what the stations want. And the, the Time Magazine, the LA Times, all of those outlets, media outlets want you to buy their paper so they can sell advertising rates at higher amounts. Uh, so be careful there. It, it's, I, I know it's hard <laughs> to take that noise with a grain of salt, but understand that you need to dig deeper if you want real information about the particular topic. Right. We all do that. All of our friends are watching the media too. So we're all talking to each other. We're all listening to it. Um, so, and that happens in our families too. We're all listening to each other. Uh, we're all listening to our siblings. We're all talking to each other in different ways. Um, we had this happen in, in one very sad situation where one of our clients was a special needs and she did have some mental issues, which is why she was in a special needs situation. But once her mother um, started listening to family members, they, she started thinking things that were happening so she changed her trust around a little bit for her. I didn't uh, know her then, but after mom died, the daughter had nothing to live on except for what her mom was providing her because she wasn't able to keep down a job. And that was why they had the special needs trust in the first place. 
But because of this information, it went to the uncle and the uncle was suddenly named as a trustee because two of the other family members, members had predeceased mom and they didn't update that. Now the uncle was thinking it. So now the uncle was hurting this, this, this daughter. The sad thing was, and I hopefully this happens to no one else, but now she's homeless and living on the street because they gave her a check of $200,000. And of course she just spent it. That's so sad. known as sudden wealth and yeah. sudden, the, the thing that follows sudden wealth is sudden poverty almost all the time. That, yeah. They're just not used to having that much money at any one time. They're not sure how to handle it. And they make a lot of decisions that are very short term decisions. So be careful of that. And by the way, earlier when I was talking about the media, I did not mean to imply that the media lies to you, but I know they can tell a story the way they want the story told to gain attention not necessarily give you the most pertinent facts. And uh, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, and in fact, some of you may have heard of Black uh, Bruce's Beach down in Manhattan Beach. Um, and in the 1920s, uh, Manhattan Beach uh, City Council did an imminent domain to, to get some parcels away from some, some white and black families living there. Um, now there's a big brouhaha about the money should go, the, the land should go back to the heirs, which happens to be worth what, probably $70 million right now or more. So, um, and, and I've read stories that I know are not factual. I know because I'm, the Man, I'm on the Manhattan Beach Historical Society Board of Directors. So I pay attention to this stuff and I read things in newspapers that are not factual all the time. So where are we? Over here? Yeah. This things we know, but do not do with our money. Right there. Things we, oh, 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 <laughs> things we know, but do not do with our money. Uh, we know to buy low and sell high, don't we? And how many times do we do that? Almost never, because we're waiting for the good news to come before we say, okay, it's safe to get in. But by the time the good news is there, everybody else has already purchased and pushed the price up high. And then when the news gets really bad, and everybody's scared, you hang on, you hang on till you can't hang on anymore, and then you sell low. So buying high and selling low will not make you ever make you any money. You've got to work against the crowd. I'll give you a perfect example of that. And that was uh, uh, 2020, the year of COVID. In the first quarter of the year, the stock market was down 33 to 37%, depending on which index you look at. Um, in May, June, July, the market started going up, but the news was still bad. People were, more people were dying, more cases were, were, were being uh, discovered, uh, more infections happened. And so why would the market be going up in light of all of that bad news? Because the market is about six months ahead of where the country will be. Uh, there were a lot of smart people who said, you know what, we're gonna have a vaccine for this late in 2020 or early in 2023. And we're gonna have a vaccine and that's gonna start reducing cases. Plus we know how to control this by social distancing and wearing a mask. So we're gonna start, the, the economy will start to open up at, at the beginning of 2023. And so at the end of 2020, the market that was down 37%, 33, 37, is now up 18% for the year. But the news didn't get much better until late in December when vaccines were, we knew vaccines were coming. So, um, you want to buy stuff when it's cheap and when the market goes down, that's when stuff is cheap. If you buy, uh, if you go shopping on black Friday, cause it's cheaper. Why wouldn't you do the same thing on COVID March or April or June or July? So just a couple of thoughts there. Yeah, I think it's difficult because we feel we don't know when the bottom is going to hit. So we don't want to buy when we think we could lose money again. Yeah. Uh, that was really interesting in our lifetime to have seen something like that. That was uh, two records were set that year. One, yeah. the market went down the most in the shortest period of time. And the other record was the market went up the most in the shortest period of time. Two records. I mean, you're lucky if you see one record every five years. But this was it, two in one year. It's amazing. Uh, I think we see this too when our friends tell us they bought something and it's going up and up and up. And then you think you have fear of missing out. Yeah. You try to buy it and it's up at the highest. So you're not buying it on sale. And the things are going down. Everyone's selling. You, you're not buying either. You're doing. You're so afraid of watching it. 
people are selective in what they tell other people. And if I want you to think I'm brilliant because my ego demands it, then I'm going to tell you exactly what I want you to hear. I, I bought Bitcoin at, at one dollar a coin or whatever it is, and now it's worth a uh, you know hundred thousand. Aren't I brilliant? Well, yeah, it's either that or you were just lucky. Uh, but you don't hear them tell you very often when they lost money. And I can tell you, everybody that's in a risk-based uh, position is there's going to be losers and there's going to be winners. Uh, so one of the things I've noticed is that. And the what ifs I mentioned earlier, we'll talk about that some more. So here we are down about 20% year to date in the stock market. So your cerebral cortex is thinking, what if, what if the market falls further? What if it really is different this time and the sky really is falling? What if Russia invades Europe and we're pulled into that? What if I don't have enough money to live on in retirement? What if I have to pay a hundred dollars a gallon for gasoline? Do you see a common thread there? Every one of those what ifs is ne has a negative outcome. Every one has a negative outcome. You didn't see, what if I win the lottery and I don't have to worry about this anymore? <laughs> okay, you don't see that when you're doing the what ifs. So uh, you should be very, very careful about what if thinking, overthinking. Um, so having more knowledge is also very helpful uh, we should be on uh, the uh, slide that shows the uh, the graph, the bar graph. This one drops up here. Oh, okay. That one's next. Sorry, that's yours. Larry's Sorry. Larry's showing it. Okay. <laughs> Worrying okay. about the what ifs is just a waste of time, valuable time that could be spent on things you can control. I think that's part of the what ifs is you can't control those things, and it causes you to overthink and focus on things that aren't helping you move forward. I mentioned earlier that you need to have some information so you can make a decision, real information. So the next slide should be a graph showing you some information. And I'll turn around here and see if that's it. Okay. You can see that bar, those bars represent the U.S. stock market from 1980 to 1921. So it's 42 years of the S&P 500 index performance. The, the, the zero line is a straight horizontal line, and the market was either up, the, the bar is in, in uh, vertical, I mean, is uh, pointing upward, or if the bar is pointing down, that means the, the market ended negative in that year. And underneath that, you see these little diamond shapes, and that tells you what happened during the year. Sometime during the year, the uh, first bar shows was down, uh, 19%, 17 or 19, I should, should put my glasses on. Uh, uh, so at some point during the year, the market was down, that didn't help, 17%. But it ended the year up some 20 something percent. So it ended the year up. So that the fact that there was a drawdown during, drawdown during the year of 17 or 18%, did that really matter? It shouldn't, it shouldn't matter at all. And so you can see in every year there were drawdowns. That is normal. That is normal. And sometimes the drawdowns lead to losses at the end of the year. But as you can see, there are more bars above the, the horizontal line. That means that more often than not, you made money. In fact, let me give you the numbers. 33 years were up and nine years were down for the year. The market was down for the year. That's a 78.5% chance of winning versus a 21.5% chance of losing. Now, 71% of the time I win, 21% of the time I lose. What would you do if you got those odds in Vegas? What would you do right now? Get in the car, jump on the plane, head to Las Vegas, because those are phenomenal odds of winning. So intra-year drawdowns are normal. It happens every year. So you say, wait a minute, okay, I see this. This is, this is well and good, but I need more evidence. You know, 43 years, this is not long of a period of time. So if you look at the next graph, that runs from 1928 to 2021, getting close to 100 years, 94 years to be exact. There were 29 negative years, or 30%, 30.85, and 65 positive years, 69% chance of winning. You probably want to play that game. Uh, and I bet what some people might be thinking, though, is if they're in this long, if they're in this year right here looking yes. to retire, 
and they see the market just went down significantly, what is that? How do they get out of that feeling of dread? Well, with the knowledge that I'm going to win most of the years that I'm in the market, that should calm the nerves a little bit and say, okay, you know what? It's down this year, but I'm not going to go into poverty because of that. Once I retire, that's not going to happen. It's unlikely to happen. So uh, that <laughs> once you retire and as you get older, you worry more, you worry more and it, you're more nervous, but that's the amygdala talking. That's not your cerebral cortex thinking rational thoughts. That's the amygdala, amygdala. Uh, so keep in mind that the, you can't go, you can't win if you, if you don't have a chance of losing. Does that make any sense? Yeah, right. So, um, so keep in mind that the downs are short term and most of the years you're in the market, you're going to have positive returns. Uh, and you're not going to take all your money out when you retire. You're only going to take pieces of it out. Yeah, I mean, so the market's down. So what do you do? You, you sell everything, you put the money in the bank? Well, yeah, I guess you could. You wouldn't want to do that in the last 20 years when we had practically zero interest rates, but uh, you could, uh, but not a, not a great plan for the future. Um, let's look at the next slide. You can see the probability of recovery. These are your odds of recovering from a 10% portfolio loss. And it's uh, the, the first, uh, the red line show there's a 10% loss, 20%, 35, 50, and 65. And so what you need to get to come back from a 10% loss to break even is 11.1% return. Think of it like this. If I start with $100 and it drops to 50, I've lost 50% of my money. To get back to even, I've got to have 100%, I've got to make 100% of the, of the $50. It's actually 200%, but it, you, you need to double your money is what you need to do. So going down, the numbers are small. Getting back to even, the numbers are bigger than the numbers that show them going down. So your odds are basically 50-50 to recover it within one year. And the longer you go out, the greater your odds get. You get to 10 years, you get a 93% chance of recovering. Uh, and you can, you can look at the other numbers there. Uh, I've never seen a 65% drawdown in the stock market in my lifetime. Uh, it, it may have happened. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember ever seeing it, or a 50% for that matter. We got pretty close. In fact, I think it may be, yeah, in 2008, we were pretty close to that. But you can see that you got pretty good odds of coming back relatively quickly. Um, now, many times, and, and Grace, this kind of uh, uh, um, points to, uh, addresses your concern about, well, I'm going to retire. What do I do when the market goes down? Many times I've heard clients say, look, I don't have 20 years because I'm 65. I don't have 20 years ahead of me to wait for the stock market to come back. So the truth is, none of us know how long we're going to live. That's just a guess on your part. That's a what if thinking on your part. So let's take a look at what the numbers tell us. Let's take a look at what the numbers tell us. The next slide shows the time to recovery for the 10 worst declines. These are the 10 worst declines in the stock market as of the day this graph was done. This graph doesn't show uh, 2008, but uh, it, was, it was done sooner than that. But these are the 10 worst declines. The first one, the, the 10th worst decline was from January of 2000 to October of 2002. So to get back to even, it took you two years and nine months. Most of us would probably say, yeah, I probably got another two years and nine months to go. Uh, and if you look at the, let's say the number one, the worst decline in the market was between April of 1930 and July of 1932. Uh, to get back to even, it would take you two years and three months. So you can see how long it's taken to recover from the 10 worst declines in history as of the day this graph was done. And so this worrying about, I don't have 10 years or I don't have 20 years is, is overthinking and it's not productive because that's not what the history has shown us has happened. And so I think what we've shown you, we've raised a couple of questions for you. So when you're having these thoughts, are you using some sort of bias to create an idea that you have in your head that you may or may not want most of the time not want but you're trying to prove it to yourself so we've shown you the biases we've shown you the evidence phil has created some great evidence showing you that our worries are largely 
misplaced. So how do we avoid human nature in this case? It's all human nature. We, there's nothing we can say except that you have to recognize it. Um, when you, what you focus on grows. That's, we've all heard about that. So you focus on fear, you'll see more fear. If you focus on success, you'll see more success. That is the positive confirmation bias, right, Bill? Yes. You start focusing on success, you'll see more of it. Yes. Um, if you, uh, with, without a plan in mind, um, means your decisions are not well thought out. They're made hastily based on what was possible. So if you don't plan your estate early enough and you, and you end up in probate, your relatives will have to deal with what was left behind um, based on what was possible at the time. They can't do anything about some of those decisions that were made or not made. Um, it's driven by what you had to do because you didn't have enough time. So if you don't invest properly or have a plan in mind, and then you try to make money in two years, you're gonna to have to take a lot of risk. Everyone can see that. It's basically by using no plan at all. And there's emotionally devastating uh, results that can be created just by that. So it's usually not beneficial for you. When you use a plan or an advisor for these things, um, using a plan means the decisions were well thought out based on information, based on knowledge, based on thoughtfulness, and based on your goals, not based on your emotions. So we need to get a hold of those emotions and just let them be, recognize that we have them, and see what we can do to live our lives without uh, being uh, pushed around by our emotions. Yeah, I'd like to add to that by saying, um, failing the plan, failing to plan is planning to fail. I must've heard that a hundred years ago, yeah. but it's, it's very true. Um, so, Block out the noise, recognize emotional thinking, emotional overthinking when you, when you, when you, when you do it, recognize it. And uh, I, if I was going to war, as a general, I was going to war, I'd have a battle plan. I would definitely have a battle plan. I wouldn't just go out there and say, well, let's see what happens. So planning is critical, especially for your state needs. Uh, the, the disasters that Grace has seen and I've seen in, in the states that weren't planned well or at all, uh, it's, it's kind of a shame and you lose, you, you hurt those you love the most because that's, that's who you want to get your assets, not, not the attorneys in the probate court. So do your estate planning, do your financial planning, and I wish you the best of luck. Watch the emotions now. <laughs> Thanks so much, Grace and Bill, for the, the, um, Excellent presentation here, and you know we all have emotions, and they do impact our, uh, you know, the way we make decisions. So we did get a few questions during the presentation, and I'm going to read them. Um, we're doing this electronically this time instead of handwritten, so I'll read these, and and uh, you can both answer, or each or one or the other take it. So the first one is, what are the issues to naming two people as successor trustee? And what do you recommend instead? Yeah. You know, the problem is they have to agree on everything together or there's an impasse. And so we have a couple right now, uh, very good friends of mine. So I even told them don't do it and they did it anyway. Oh no, everything will be fine. My sister, never a problem. You know, we want everything. And they actually sat there in my office together saying, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Along with mom sitting there. But now they're, they're having a problem and um, one sister is living here. Mom moved to Texas to be with the other sister. The other sister has cows and she got mom to buy some land. Well, mom doesn't need any land. Obviously she needs land for the cows. So that was a big concern. She didn't ask anybody, didn't tell anyone. So this is where the problems occur. So now we got to figure out what's going to happen with the plan. Like, how's that going to be paid back? One daughter is going to benefit. The land could be worth more money than the other. So the hard thing is two people don't always see things the same way. And that's why you really want to have one or three. Three is too many, I think. Um, but that at least you don't have an impasse. And then maybe in some situations, if you don't have siblings that you think will be on the same page, you might want to just name a private fiduciary. And then they can handle those issues uh, and avoid those problems. The, the problem with financial, with, um, private fiduciaries is you need to find one that works with your family that you can relate to because the, the relationship is obviously emotionally based 
and also uh, requires you to have the same moral values. So I always say, make sure your successor trustee has similar moral values to yourselves so that you're picking the right person who would make the choices you would make. All right, thank you. The, and, and I'll add to that, we do have, I, I can provide a list of our, all of our professional advisory council members. So as the, you know, they both talked about the importance of making a plan and, and it's helpful to have some experts work with you. So uh, we have attorneys, financial planners, professional fiduciaries on our professional advisory council and I'm happy to provide that to anybody who might be interested in that. The second question is what's wrong with including a daughter on a bank account? <laughs> So, well, the difficulty is, uh, I'll tell you the legal things first. Um, once you put a child on your bank account, then it's subject to that child's creditors. And the IRS likes to take money out of bank accounts immediately if someone owes money. So that could happen. It's happened to several uh, people I know. Um, it's, it's not the smartest things to do. It's also an immediate gift. So I don't know if there's other children, but that could cause trouble with the other children. They suddenly don't own the property anymore. And it goes directly to that uh, child on the death of the parent. Um, and that might not be your, your estate plan intention. Um, if it is, that's considered a way of avoiding, so a payable on death accounts are the way to avoid certain um, estate planning issues with some accounts. I personally don't like the idea, but it is a way, it's better than nothing, put it that way. Uh, but the daughter now owns half the account automatically and she can do whatever she wants with it. She could spend it, and in this case, with Phil's uh, two daughters, they were changing the money for mom the way they wanted it to be done. But um, it's not wise because the gift is already uh, a problem, and then you have the creditor issue. Uh, if a power you, of attorney is what you would use. I'm sorry, I should have said that. If you, uh, if you say, well, it would be really, really convenient if my daughter could, if my daughter pays my bills, okay? so. We need to set up a joint account. Okay, if you do that, that's fine. But don't put all your eggs in that basket. Put enough in there to pay the bills and that's it. And then just replenish it once a month or however often you have to. That way you got a minimum amount of money at risk. And if the, if, if the parent does pass away, the surviving joint tenant daughter uh, will own all of that. She has no obligation to pass that around to her relatives. So. That's that one strategy that you could, a little bit of a workaround, just don't put much money there. Yeah, another, another thing we should mention too about that is um, when you're setting up your bank accounts for an estate plan, you wanna put money in the trust account, make sure the money is in the trust account. Um, sometimes people leave money in, a, in their own name. You also wanna keep that under the threshold for the, to go into probate, but for sure, it's much better. Your checking account, uh, Ten to fifteen thousand dollars is fine, but anything more than that should be in a trust account just to protect your financial and your estate plan. Okay, thank you. Um, another question: How do you pick, how do you pick a financial planner that's right for you? Very good question, and I don't have a tr tremendous answer. I can tell you that you probably should talk to a couple of them, but be careful of a certain bias, and that is. I get tired of talking to these people. I want to make a decision. So you go with the last person you spoke to, not necessarily the best person for you. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can check their, their credibility. Uh, there's an organization called the uh, Financial Industry Regulatory Authority called FINRA, F-I-N-R-A. And they have a website, F-I-N-R-A dot org. And when you go on that website, there'll be a, a link to broker check. And so you can find out about their, their history, their regulatory history. Have they had a lot of complaints filed against them? Have they had fines? Have they been terminated from brokerage firms because of bad behavior, things like that. So you, you, wanna, you wanna definitely go there and check them out. If they're a certified financial planner, you can go to the CFP Board of Standards, CFP, Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards, and they also have some disclosure areas where you can find out that uh, find out about their history. So do those things, talk to them, and maybe you go slow. Maybe you just don't do everything at once. Maybe you just do a little bit at a time and see how see if this person really is what they say they are. 
Good, thank you, Phil. How do we as financial dummies get the information needed to make competent decisions? Uh, <laughs> they call themselves a dummy. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. You've got to do what just about what somebody in the business would do. You've got to subscribe to different databases. You've got to listen to people who, the other day I heard a, a fellow who was a PhD in economics and he's very high up in, in, the, uh, in, in the industry he works in. And I would like to think that he's somebody I could listen to and rely on. You're not gonna get that kind of information mostly in your day-to-day -day activities. So you've got to search it out. You've got to, you've got to find that. You've got to talk, to talk to other people and talk to them about if they use an advisor, what do they like about their advisor? What do they don't like about their advisor? Uh, and you want to try to be sure that the person you're talking to is in a similar situation as your own. Uh, talking to somebody who has no money or somebody who's a billionaire uh, and talking about their advisors may not, may not do you much good. So find somebody in a similar situation that has an advisor, ask about that, uh, check their, their, their regulatory history, um, and maybe you subscribe to The Economist. I don't know, I just told you to be careful with media, <laughs> but I, I uh, subscribe to Barron's. I think it's a very good magazine. I don't listen to everything they say, and one of their stock tips lost me a fair amount of money. So, uh, and, and others have made me money. So uh, I, I think it's as good as it gets, but those are the kind of stories you, I mean, those are, that's the in-depth work you have to do to begin to understand uh, markets and how they work and how they interact and get different opinions from different experts, not your neighbor, not your cousin, Charlie, get the, uh, the uh, information from experts like a PhD in economics or a professor of, uh, you know, mathematics, things like that. I, I'd like to add to that. I think that, uh, you know, Phil's going to have all the charts and graphs. You don't have to understand those. He's going to show those to you. I think you need to find someone who is emotionally similar to you, who you like to spend time with, because really what you need to do is make your goals, get your goals in place and have your plans uh, thought out and then let someone else do all the nitty gritty because you should be playing with your grandchildren and or teaching a class or or uh, doing what you like to do. That's what Phil does, just like you don't go. You don't go to the emergency room here to work unless you're a doctor. You come here because you need something. You don't try to be the doctor for yourself, right? So it's the same kind of a thing. Yeah, that's a good point. The you know using the certified financial planners like Phil has that designation. Larry, who was here earlier, and um, others. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip ahead um, because we have a couple other questions that are financial planner related. And one is how is a financial planner paid, and what is the cost to have the advice of a financial planner? There are three methods that every financial advisor in the country works under. None of them are, not, not one of them is perfect in all senses. They each have their pluses and minuses, so keep that in mind. You could pay a, a financial advisor on an hourly basis, and the rate I've seen around here is $50 an hour to roughly $300 an hour. You could hire a, an advisor who gets paid on a commission basis. That is, you buy something, you sell something, that person gets paid a commission. Again, pluses and minuses there. The commission de depends on the product. It could range from a half a percent to as much as five and three quarters. Those are one-time charges. Um, and then the third method is, is what's called a fee basis, where you pay the advisor a percentage of the value of your portfolio. So I, let's say I got a million dollar portfolio and I'm gonna, and the advisor has charged me 1%, I'm gonna pay, I'm gonna pay him $10,000 a year to make transactions. Now. When I do make transactions, when he, he or she does make transactions, there's no commissions involved. There's no hourly fee for any advice he, he or she gives you. There's just that annual fee. Pluses and minuses there. Uh, one thing to remember though, is that conflict of interest is apparent in all the places uh, in greater or lesser degrees. But with a fee-based advisor, the, um, the advisor's interests are exactly aligned with yours. I want 1% of $2 million, not 1% of $1 million. So if I can get your portfolio to go from a million to 2 million, you're happy, I'm happy. 
An, an add-on question to that, Phil, because I get this question sometime is, do you um, sit down with someone and help them with a financial plan if you're not managing their investments? I don't because in, in that regard, I would be I charge an hourly rate and I personally don't work on an hourly rate. Uh, so I, I wouldn't I imagine there are some planners who do do that. OK, thank you. And then, uh, Grace, while we're kind of on the cost, the question is if if uh, you know, what is the cost to put, put together a trust and a will? And if you have a trust, do you also need a will? Uh, you know, the, tr the costs vary, and I'd say, uh, I like to say it's kind of like a mortgage payment because the people with bigger mortgages have bigger problems. <laughs> um, but between three and $5,000, I think, is the average in our community. You've seen, I've seen some less, I've seen some more, but the average is about that a much. Um, what was the second part of the question? It, what does it, well, the cost, and do, if you have a trust, do you need a will? So maybe you can review what is a, a standard estate plan, what's included in that. Yeah, the uh, a standard estate plan includes whatever is involved for that particular family, but the, the first thing you want to do is stay out of probate. So probate avoidance is a living trust, including that, we usually include powers of attorney for that, the assignment to assign anything that's not real estate related into the trust. You want to change your bank accounts. That's something that we do after we sign. And the trust transfer deed to make sure all the real estate's in there. Uh, sometimes we have limited powers of attorney for grandparents to take over for children uh, to, who are um, babysitting children. We have a, a younger family. Um, we have some other things for older clients that need um, special attention in certain places. We, we, those are different things. It just depends, but the average are those five documents. Um, we always add the statutory power of attorney now, I do, um, because the banks insist on it, and they, but the investment plan, investment companies don't, so they want the 30-page power of attorney. The one thing I like to point out is why we use that uniform power, really only because the banks insist on it, because when you get to choose what you're going to give your agent the power to act upon, they don't define any of those topics. And my favorite one is the first one on the list is real estate transactions. Well, what does that mean? Are you giving someone the right to sell your house, to mortgage your house, or just plan uh, signing documents? I mean, there's a difference there. That's why we have our 30 page power of attorney to make sure it goes well. Uh, and then of course you wanna update that every three to five years because things can change. As your family grows, things will, will uh, alter and you'll want to change things. Uh, we have a client care program in my firm, so we, have, we want to keep people close to us so that we can help them when they refinance their house so that their deed doesn't get lost and taken out of the, prop, out of the trust and not put back in. That's very important. Uh, also, people move. We want to make sure those um, powers of attorney are updated. Now, the, what's happening now is none of the banks are allowing you to have an old power of attorney in place. If it's more than three years, they want a brand new one. So keep that in mind. You might have to update your power of attorney quicker. And then also um, the will, the pour over will is usually used inside the power of attorney just in case something gets left out. We can argue to the court that it should be in the trust and that's on papers instead of going through a full uh, blown probate. Um, so that's how you, you would include that too. You don't need a will, a, the old typical will outside of a trust. That's actually more confusing for the courts. So we definitely want to uh, revoke those when you do a trust. So you'll have the will as part of your package. Pour over will. Another way to look at it is that um, if you have a trust that doesn't eliminate the need for a will, um, there are some things that you can't, the trust only controls the assets that it owns. So it might own your house, it might own your, uh, your uh, bank account, it might own your, your brokerage account, but the trust doesn't own your clothes. It doesn't own your jewelry, and it probably doesn't own your car. So how do you get those assets through the probate process with the least amount of expense possible, and that's where the will comes in? We use an assignment. We assign those assets to the trust. Oh, okay. All right. Automatically. All right. But if something That's... gets lost out, like, so if you have jewelry, special jewelry, you want to take pictures of it, make sure you put that in there to make sure that it's automatically included. If you have an unusual asset. Now, what's interesting is digital assets. We have a special uh, agreement in my uh, firm to make sure your digital assets are 
transferred. A lot of people have Bitcoin. That's a perfect example. Uh, Bitcoin also things are in your computer now. We all store things in our computer. So who gets the computer? Very important to have the right person collect on that. We had a family recently where we did our digital assets program. Thank goodness because the ne'er-do-well brother-in-law comes from Indianapolis with a criminal record of embezzlement. And the first thing he wanted was a computer and the phone. Luckily, she had said, I want that to go to my son. So he couldn't take it. So those are very important. It's, it's so, such a huge issue right now, digital assets. So I'm really big on those because a few years ago, I had a digital problem and I learned my lesson. <laughs> All right, we have, I, I think this will be our last question and it's, it's kind of directed toward Grace, but it might impact Phil too. It's like any suggestions on how to communicate with family about what your estate, uh, what my estate plan involves and how can I avoid conflicts? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what we do is we have a family meeting so we can talk about after everything is signed, what the plan is and why. We also have a letter of instructions that you can use that, that's in your own handwriting. You can communicate to your family members that way if you don't wanna meet up with everybody. Um, I think it's best if the kids know or your beneficiaries know what's happening because then they will understand why things were chosen the way they were. I have a client who uh, chose to give three different properties, one each to each kid and didn't tell them. And they assumed that one each child would want that property. Then, of course, when they got it, the kids all wondered why I didn't get this property. Why didn't you just divide it by three? That kind of thing. You can't really control the conflicts that occur after you pass away. Unfortunately, that's just the way it mm -hmm. is. And kids go back to those sibling rivalries that, that happen back when they were kids. And they all have a feeling, a FOMO, whatever else it is, confirmation bias, it's all there. Remember, every time you're making those emotional choices, your beneficiaries or your relations that you're talking to are doing the same thing. So just as long as you recognize that might be what they're thinking about, it could help you communicate with them. Uh, but I think it's best to have, we can also have a family mediator. We have inheritance conversations in my office where you can take the family to a, a basic therapist and have a meeting there they're qualified to help those issues if they come up in advance. Uh, no one's taken me up on that, but I did arrange it because I felt like it could be useful. So if you feel like you want to talk to someone about, should I give my kids the property one third each or one fourth each, or one, one of my children is more able to handle their money than someone else and they, they don't need it. I mean, that's your choice. Of course, um, you can talk to her about that and she's very qualified to discuss that. So I think just, recognizing who you're talking to and what their thoughts are, uh, how they think is one thing. Um, that's another program altogether, trying to figure out how people think and what they need. But there are four ways of thinking. And if you have one of those four ways, you need to know how that person communicates in order to get them to understand what you're talking about. So those are a couple of things that we do in our office to help people with those uh, issues. And, um, I think we, we used to do things without telling anyone, but there's so much litigation now that it's almost worth it to go to a family mediation first. Great, thank you. That's it for the questions. So to everybody out there in Zoom land, we thank you for joining us. I know you're all giving a round of applause to uh, Grace and Phil for their great presentation and Larry was advancing the slide. So thanks Larry for also, you know, helping on that side of it. Um, with their backs to the screen, it's a little more challenging with this format, but it worked out well for that to be, for this today's presentation to be more of a, a discussion type thing. If anyone would like a printed version of the handout, please email me. My uh, email address is here. My phone number is there. So you, I'm happy to print one for you and send it out. Um, some of those charts were small. I can give you a little bit bigger version of those charts too if you'd like that. So just email me for that. The recording will be uh, edited and prepared to be posted online and that will happen um, hopefully sometime next week. So I will email everybody who pre-registered for today, the emails I have on file. If you didn't pre-register and you want to be sure to receive that notice from me when it's posted, please um, send me your email with that request as well. 
So we do have, and the handout will also be posted where the, where the uh, recording will be. So we do have one more uh, seminar this year. Uh, I was hoping to be in person again before the end of the year, but it's not looking very likely that's gonna happen. So I think September 9 is our next webinar. It will be a webinar on Zoom. And the title is IRA 401k and RMD planning to help protect your retirement. And we're um, having that presented by certified financial planners, Christian Cordoba and Connor Hartwell. So thanks again for joining us today. Thanks to the media services team, Alex and Mitchell and Lisa back there who was typing out the questions so I could read them from here. Appreciate all your support. Everybody have a great weekend.